Welcome back to another episode of Rewiring Health. So excited to be joined by Sarah Lee. So thank you so much for being here. Oh, I'm so excited to be here with you, Kelly. Yeah. So we connected and, you know, we had a conversation a few weeks ago and I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to record this episode because there's going to be so many gems that come out. And just like when we were talking, we're like, we should have been recording this. Like, (laughs) So here it is. Now we can finally dive into it. And like I said, this is just going to be such a great conversation. So I'm looking forward to it. So what I want to get right into, because I love to hear people's stories of what your journey was, because everybody has a story of what, you know, things that they go through in life that are absolute struggles, and then they don't realize where it's taking them. So do you mind sharing your journey and what brought you to where you are today and what you do today? Yes, absolutely. I don't mind at all. Um, so I was uh, in my in my twenties. I was very successful early on in my career. I was in the world of um, banking, mm-hmm. and just found that it fit me like a glove. I tend to love numbers, and I also love to serve others. So there was this combination for banking that really fit me. Um, but in addition, that was that part of my life. I also had a son. So my son was born when I was 23. And during my pregnancy, Kelly, I, um, in my mind at the time, gained way too much weight, Mm. right? I remember him being born and he was just under seven pounds. And literally I had one of my first thoughts around um, just not liking my body and trying to figure out like, how is he so small and I gained so much weight? Mm. And it was then I set out on finding a diet that was going to work for me. And I tried a lot of different things, even that during that time, Fin Fin was on the market and I was trying to get my hands on that. I, I felt very desperate. Um, and then one day coming home from work, I passed by Weight Watchers and I was like, okay, maybe this will work. And so I walked in Weight Watchers and became a member right away. And it um, really drew me in because you're counting points, which AKA could be calories in a sense, but it's a mixture of things that come up with the point system. And you weigh in every week, you go to a group meeting. So there's like this community and social aspect and you actually get cheered on, at least you did back then when you got on the scale and you lost weight that week. Mm -hmm. So there was this combination of Weight Watchers for me that included numbers, In addition, this cheering me on and social aspect of actually losing weight, my perfectionistic side, which I know you talk a lot about on your podcast, um, definitely rose to the top for me quickly. And there was no negotiating. I stuck to my points and that was it. And I did that for over six months, Kelly. Um, And uh, I was at then like the lowest point thing. And I hit my goal, lifetime goal weight and all this kind of stuff. And then one day I went out for a happy hour with a bunch of work people and they were passing around chocolate cake. And I remember calculating in my head, oh my gosh, this is like a whole day's worth of Weight Watcher points. I've never gone over my points. This is going to be ruinous. And everybody was like cheering me on, like take a bite. You know, you've you've done great. You've lost all that pregnancy weight, you know, all those comments. So I took a bite of this chocolate cake and I remembered like this, this weird like place where I felt out of my body. And like, I needed to eat all the chocolate cake. Mm -hmm. And um, to fast forward that evening, I decided to purge for the first time. Not even, I didn't even know anything about eating disorders, by the way. I didn't know anything, Mm -hmm. but I just knew like, I went over my Weight Watcher points. I feel super guilty. This is going to ruin everything. And I have to eliminate. Mm -hmm. And it was then, um, and I remember afterwards, I remember thinking, okay, that'll never happen again don't want to do that. Yeah. And, um, it took hold of me and I struggled then for seven years secretly with bulimia. Mm-hmm. And, um, I felt very stuck in the vicious cycle into the outside world. I was a single mom making it happen, co-parenting with my, my son's father. I had a great career. Um, I got lots of compliments all the time on how I look so great because my body never got to a place where people may be worried I'm sick. Mm -hmm. Instead, they thought I looked wonderful. And behind closed doors, I struggled. Um, And just, you know, fast forwarding more, I finally went into recovery, you know, because my son found me passed out on the floor. And I always get emotional when Mm -hmm. I talk about this. Mm -hmm. Um, He has no memory of that. 
he was seven years old. Um, it may be a repressed memory. I don't know, mm -hmm. but I remember waking up to him crying over me and his little glasses all fogged up and just thinking, what am I doing mm -hmm. that I've got to change? Mm -hmm. And so with some health issues, which it had to be everything, but my eating disorder, right? I blamed everything, but my eating disorder mm -hmm. and nobody knew I was struggling. Nobody. Mm -hmm. Um, it was that moment. I was like, something's got to change. And, um, I was actually rushed to the hospital and the next day I dropped to my knees and begged God to help me that I couldn't do it on my own. So it was this combination of my son, my health and giving myself over to the Lord that put me into recovery. And I've now been recovered 17 years. Wow. Um, I left the banking world after 18 years of being in banking and have been coaching now for almost seven years, helping other people break free wow. too. Oh my God. Like, I like, as you're talking, I'm like getting goosebumps because it's just like, to f like, you can almost feel how you felt in that moment. It's like that, that external validation you've gotten all along telling that you're worthy if you weigh this weight you're worthy if you restrict or you're worthy if you look this certain way and it's like that it just embeds in our hearts and then it's also that like the guilt and shame of you are showing you know you you're feeling this you know what the truth is and then the world is now encouraging you to do something that you know is deep down harming you it's it's just a complete battle and then all the while trying to be a mom on top of that it's like just all the worlds collide and it's just oh my gosh just you know it's it's just it, it's like my heart breaks for you for where you were in that moment because I can very much relate to that in a very different way and it's like you know that trap of how you feel like you are completely stuck and I really believe it's like unless you've experienced that it's not like I think sometimes people like oh it's a lack of self-control or it's like that is nothing like that it is that you literally are you feel helpless like you feel yes. like you have you can't you can't help yourself like it is like That's this right this force within you that you can't overcome in that moment. And it's like, you feel powerless. You and do. But, well, it morphs, yeah. right, Kelly? It morphs into a place in that moment with the chocolate cake. For yeah. me, it was about ruining this streak I had with food mm. and weight. But what happened was that anxiety I felt in that mo moment by um, purging. And I just like to talk, I don't want to trigger mm -hmm. any of the listeners, but I like to talk very frankly because I feel like it's needed to lift the shame. Mm -hmm. So in that moment, after I had self-induced vomiting, I felt a relief mm -hmm. and that relief became yeah. um, very addictive in the best way I can explain it to people that have never had this or battled with it. It's like, you're so tightly wound. You have this anxiety in you. It feels like you can't breathe. And then after this behavior, you feel lighter, you can breathe again. Yeah. And there's also this place of shame. Cause you're like, I know this isn't good for me. I know this isn't something <laughs> that I should be doing, yeah. but it becomes a very addictive cycle, just like substances can be for people. hundred percent. Yes. And you're, you're so right. Like the way you describe it, that is, that's so what you experience. And, you know, I I've shared my struggles with bulimia too. And it's like, for what helped me really understand, cause like when I was doing that, I felt like there's something wrong with me, but what helped me is understand the science behind it. And when you talk about that relief for with bulimia, the purge is actually a release of dopamine and that dopamine is that reward cycle. So you are actually getting rewarded in your brain for something that is maladaptive and it, it is going to hinder your health, but you get a reward. So it's that cycle of like what you cognitively know what you should be doing versus what your brain is saying, no, that you're getting rewarded for this. And it's, it's yes, it's such a battle. Yeah, it is. It really, really is. And then there's the physical relief too, because, you know, as I got going with bulimia, there yeah. was major binges. So I would, I, my cycle was, I was very restrictive and I'd go back to my Weight Watcher points, right? Yeah. Lowest points possible. And I do yeah. that for like a week or mm -hmm. a week and a half. And then the uh, urge would come over me. And at the time it felt very like something was possessing me. Mm -hmm. I would even physically shake trying to surf the urge and I would shake. I literally remember being in a Walmart line and I had this bag full of 
all these foods I was going to binge on. And I was shaking because the checkout lady was moving really slowly. And I was like, I just want to get home and eat all this food. And I remember that so vividly, yeah. you know, that it was like my drug. I'm like, I need to do this. And I was physically, so there is the, the psychological, the brain chemical piece, but yeah. there's also this physical component to it. And you bring up, I, I want to say this because I, I know some of your story by following you, mm -hmm. but with bulimia too, there's some misunderstanding because there's two types of compensatory behaviors. Mm -hmm. There's the compensatory behavior that's the most well-known that we're talking about, which is the self-induced vomiting. Yeah. But there is a non-purging compensatory behavior and people don't necessarily associate that with bulimia a lot of times. But I believe Kelly, if I'm right, you mentioned to me, or I've heard you say that you used exercise 100%. quite often as a compensatory Absolutely. behavior. That's how I and started. So, yeah. Okay. So mm -hmm. some people don't realize mm -hmm. that when they think of bulimia, they just think of binging and self-induced vomiting, mm -hmm. but there's also an element of using other behaviors yeah. to compensate for what you feel is a binge or what is mm -hmm. actually defined as a binge. 100%. Absolutely. Yeah. And thank you for bringing that up too, because what I found, I don't know if you did, I don't know if you also experienced exercise as a way of mm -hmm. purging, but what I found is that I was an athlete and it was a very slippery slope, gray line. I did not even recognize I had an eating disorder until I was purging by vomiting. I literally, the exercise, like, no, I'm an athlete. This is what I do. I, I exercise, you know, for six hours a day. Doesn't everybody who's an athlete, you know, and like, right. same thing, right. like, was getting like, wow, you're so disciplined. Oh my gosh, you're in so good, such good shape. Like I was getting so much reward for that and praise that it's like, it, it just perpetuates it. And you identify as that person of like, this is who I am. So I can't, I have to hold on to this identity. Yeah, that's right. That's so right. True. And I know we can get frustrated with the culture mm -hmm. and those around us, but it's just um, a lack of understanding, you know, yeah. and if you haven't, um, I always say those of us that struggle with it, an eating disorder, right? We took it to the extreme. Mm -hmm. We took the diet to the extreme. We took the exercise to the extreme. We took it to the extreme. We dove into the deep end of the pool, mm -hmm. right? But so many people in our culture are, you know, <laughs> obsessed with diet, obsessed with their body, not happy, all of these things. Things, but they're not necessarily in the deep end, yeah. right? They may be like in the middle or the kiddie pool. So when they say things like this, it's not to try to reinforce some behavior that you have. Mm -hmm. It's just, they don't get it. Yeah. hundred percent. Absolutely. Yes. And yeah, it was like no malice behind it, but it's like, we all have our own lens. And so when we are living with that day in and day out, you're seeing and hearing things through your own lens. So even though they may think like, wow, I wish I could exercise like her, they don't know the struggles and there's a lot of secrecy. And like, I know you talk about this. I would love for you to just share that too. Like the, the secrecy, the privacy, the hiding. Can you talk about that in your journey? Because that's such a huge component, especially with bulimia. And I think yes. a lot, many of us struggle in silence and it needs to be changed because that's part of the problem. It mm -hmm. is part of the problem. And that's one reason, and we'll kind of get to this later in the podcast, but mm -hmm. you know, this one reason that my partner and friend, a fellow coach, we developed a program just for bulimia mm -hmm. because we are finding, it's like, I knew it because that's my lived experience, but now mm -hmm. doing this work for almost seven years and working with all types of eating disorders, mm -hmm. I find that there is the most shame with bulimia because of the compensatory behavior, specifically the self-induced vomiting. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I think for, you know, with some of the other eating disorders, you know, we're more open about talking about emotional eating and binge eating in our culture. Um, the restrictive end of the behavior sometimes can be control and um, <laughs> disciplined or something like that, but you can't put a silver lining or spin on the self-induced vomiting, you know, if that makes sense. So when I was struggling, um, no way did I want to identify with this. Um, I thought I really looked at it as like, honestly, a monster that would just take over me sometimes. Um, that if I could just, I had it in my mind, if I could just stick to my Weight Watcher points all the time, everything would be fine. Um, and even when I, so nobody knew I struggled. And even when I decided to go into recovery at that moment, there was probably only three to four people in my very close circle that knew 
Mm-hmm. And then um, when I felt a couple years in very strong in my recovery, still nobody knew. Mm-hmm. Still, when I felt really strong in my recovery and I was living a recovered life, I could not speak of this. Mm-hmm. I remember one time sitting around the table with my husband's family and he's just so proud of me and everything I've overcame. And we were in a deep conversation. And he brought up, he's like, well, you know, Sarah struggled with an eating disorder and she's overcame it. I remember I'm free at this moment, feeling humiliated. And when we wow. left, you know, he could tell something was wrong with me. And he's like, what's the matter? I said, I just, I wish we wouldn't have told them. Mm-hmm. And he said, I'm sorry. Like he felt terrible. Right. But, you know, then I thought, well, it is okay. I have overcame it. But even then I was so ashamed. It wasn't until Kelly, I decided and had the calling placed on my heart that I wanted to help others. And I went and found how to get certified, (laughs) how to, you know, build my own practice, how to do all this, um, that I became quote unquote, out there with it. Mm -hmm. And I remember the first time I decided to post it to Facebook and it was on national eating disorder awareness week. Mm -hmm. And I decided, Mm -hmm. okay, I'm just going to put like the hotline out there for Nita Mm -hmm. (laughs) and observe the week. And I was scared Mm -hmm. of doing that. Mm -hmm. So it took me a long time just because I was fearful of what others would think of me, Mm -hmm. you know, especially because they had a, um, image of me as very successful in my career, being able to hold my whole life together. Um, One of my very best friends um, that I've been best friends for a while, when I finally came out with it, I'm talking like seven years ago, right? Like 10 years into recovery. um, I came out with it and started telling my personal story to release shame. My best friend, I remember text me, she's like, I would have never guessed this about you. Here are her words. She said, yeah. I would have never guessed this about you. I thought you and your life were perfect. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh and I remember God. getting that text from her. And I remember thinking, yeah, that was my goal, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I wasn't perfect. I was living in shame and guilt and shaking at checkout center, you know, the checkout line at Walmart mm-hmm. because I needed a binge and purge. And mm-hmm. I was stuck in a vicious cycle. But even those close to me never knew. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that and that's the most profound thing is like you have the closest people and like I can very much relate to what you're saying the closest people in your life. And you did such a good job of holding it all together, creating this this persona that the world would see, even though you're deeply struggling. And it is absolutely draining to live like that it's so draining to make sure that every little piece is just so that you hide and protect this person inside you and this feeling inside you it is it's so draining to be like that and it's and thank you for sharing how you were saying you know coming out as far as sharing this to the world because there's so many layers to that and it does take a very long time individual process like we all have to come you know and disclose that as we're comfortable, but it is so hard. And I experienced that the same, the same thing. I mean, it was literally 15 years after I went through it. My best friends are like, I had no idea either. So I can very much relate. I mean, literally, I remember making my first post too on social media and I'm like, well, here we go. And it was freaky. It was absolutely freaky. But then there was, a, I don't know if you noticed, it's like a very therapeutic part to it when you started. 100%. Yeah. It was like, wow, it's out there. And then of course the response yeah. from people was like, you're so strong to share this. And, you know, it's very yes. like positive and it felt yeah. like a relief mm-hmm. to finally share something. I didn't even know I needed to share mm-hmm. that part of me was like, well, that's something I dealt with in my past. It was a struggle mm-hmm. I had in my past, you yeah. know, but when I felt pulled to help others, cause I get it, mm-hmm. I've been there. And, you know, you're talking about the energy it takes, you know, it made me think of Kelly, this goes along with shame too of when you feel that urge to purge and you're in social settings, Mm -hmm. right? (laughs) Or you're out and about and you end up, um, you know, giving into the behaviors in places that make you feel even more shame. Mm -hmm. Like, oh my gosh, I'm in the back of a convenience store right now doing this. This is insanity. Like if anybody could see me right now, yeah. This is really what, like, it just really messes with you and makes you want to keep it even more secret. 
Totally. And it's just that feeling of being alone. Like, because if you're the only one who knows this, you, you know, those dark moments, no one else knows those dark moments. And it just makes you feel like you're very alone in the world. So it almost put, makes you put even more of a protective wall up because you're so, you feel very vulnerable in those moments. And it's, it's so hard to, to, to get out of that, like to start moving in a direction where you're not, there's not such a gap between what the world sees and what you are experiencing. And, and I just want to share some as you were saying that, because I know we brought this up last time we talked, but one thing too, that makes it really, really tough about being open and being vulnerable. And this is why I love having a platform like this, where we can talk about this, but when you go on social media, and I know we, we said this is that the, you can't even say eating disorder because you will get either flagged or your content won't be shared out as much. You can't say bulimia. There's certain things you cannot say. So even though you're trying to share a message of, you know, positivity, healing, hope, you're not even allowed to say it on social media because of all these things. And I've experienced this when I've tried to share posts. I know you were talking about that. And that is yep. such a frustrating thing when you're an advocate for people to heal and have hope and getting out of this and you can't even share. And that's the real, it's a big issue in the shame Huge again. Issue. Yep. Huge issue. Yeah. And you're right. It did have, I'm still dealing with that on my mm -hmm. coaching Facebook page. Um, yeah. It looks like I do have some type of a shadow ban on me. Um, because my organic reach isn't at high, as high anymore ever since I started really boldly talking about bulimia. And, um, you know, perhaps your listeners can even tell by tuning in right now, but I tend to be diplomatic and very positive in my words and my scope. And it's all about hope and pursuing recovery. And if I could do it, they could do it. If you could do it, they could do it. I don't know I could get out of it, nor did I think I really wanted to. So that's always a weird place too, because you're like, I kind of don't want to do this, but what's going to happen if I stop doing this, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, as I boldly you know, talked about it on Facebook, I did get, you know, flagged and some violations of, um, was it special issue violations, but I'm working on getting it like back to normal, but it's really frustrating because you want to help people. And there's just certain topics that get limited. Mm -hmm. and, and that's such a shame because again, here we are, you know, there's people who are trying to help people who are already struggling in secrecy. And now the message is being hindered from getting to the people that need to hear it most. And, and that's such a frustrating thing. So it's, it's like, this still goes on where there is this, you know, governing bodies are hindering people from getting to the resources that they need to. And so I just wanted to I know you're getting heated. I feel you're getting heated right now because here's the other thing. Yeah. If we look back, I think it was, you know, like 2020, where definitely the whole world turned upside down, right? Going into 2021, um, you know, Meta specifically, Instagram and Facebook started to get very scrutinized for mm -hmm. a lot of things. One of the things that Instagram, and there's lots of news articles about this, but one of the things Instagram um, was, you know, not fondly looked upon is they were, they felt like they were advocating eating disorders, right? So I think that this is just my opinion. I don't have anything backing this up, everybody, but in my opinion, I feel like they tried to make good strides in saying, okay, we're not advocating eating disorders, you know, so we're going to put these uh, parameters in place to flag these issues and get them minimized in people's feed. But I feel like that went all wrong. That's why I'm getting heated. Yeah. Why we it was looked upon as Instagram specifically, you know, um, promoting eating disorders. It was the content mm -hmm. around the pictures of certain types of bodies. Mm -hmm. There was the con, there's still content around diets. Mm -hmm. that are very restrictive and certain challenges and all these kind of things. So it's not that, hey, Kelly and Sarah are out there talking about bulimia so that you can heal. It's like, no, it's because the diet ads in the restrictive yeah. mindset, it, it's diet culture. Mm -hmm. And so there's some kind of miss there. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. And, and, that, and that's what it is. It's like, and these are just like words that are getting flagged. You're, they're not, there's not even like the messages behind it. If like you read the message, it's very obvious that there's this sense of hope and healing and, you know, advocacy for people to live free from eating disorders. But yeah, it's still, it's literally like a word gets flagged and then your whole message is gone. 
And well, that's why, I mean, your podcast is fabulous, right? No, we can't get flagged for saying anything we want to on this podcast. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's all, yeah. I mean, as long as it's promoting health and healing, which it that's is, right. like, that's it, you know? And so it is, you know, I, I think it's important to bring that up because if for someone who's listening and you're feeling in that dark, secretive place where you can't show the world one thing, like, and you're, you feel like you're alone and it's, there can be this that you're not going to see a lot of messages about that on social media because it's not allowed to get to you that there are many people that experience this so so find the right resources and understand that there are people that are willing to help you may have to dig a little bit harder unfortunately because of this but this is why you know I love having you on right now because here's a resource that if you're struggling with this here it is you know yeah. like yeah. And now it can lead you to other avenues where you can really start diving to get help. And it's like, I wish conversations like this happened 20 years ago. So I could have benefited from it, but uh, you Me know, the, the, yeah, exactly. the beauty of it is that now you can take these struggles, use them as your strengths to help the past version of yourself. And that's the most beautiful thing that you can do. So yeah, I, I agree that. the past version of yourself and others. And I'll say for, you know, all your listeners to the role of the certified coach. And mm -hmm. I want to emphasize certified because right now the coaching, um, coaching in general is not regulated. So mm -hmm. if you want to work with a coach, me or somebody else, you want to make sure they're certified and specifically by the Carolyn Costin Institute. And most of the coaches, I'd say over 90% are all recovered. Mm -hmm. And um, the other percentage usually has loved somebody that has gone through it and recovered. So there's a real lived experience plus mm -hmm. the rigorous training of becoming certified to help somebody. And the role of the coach is very different than that of a therapist or dietitian. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we are very action oriented, goal oriented, and we're in the moment with you. So not only are we helping weekly in session, maybe with an eating challenge or talking about your thoughts and shifting those are, you know, we're really trying to focus on that behavioral change, but we're the person Kelly, that if you're in the bathroom and you're about to purge, you you text us mm. in the moment mm. and we get it. And we're also mm. trained to help you in those moments. So when you're talking about reaching out for help, there's a whole slew of eating disorder coaches out there now that can serve a different role. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that because I, I know when I was going through it, that was like very scary of like, you know, cause I felt like it was like all or nothing. You were either being admitted or you were not getting help. And that's where like, I, I never sought out help and I really should have. And because of that, so I love that there are coaches like you who are that person who's kind of in the middle where you can get that help that you need without feeling like your entire life is just going to be dominated by someone yeah. telling you what to do. Cause it's very scary to relinquish control and yeah. having someone who has been there understands it, especially with something so deeply impactful is absolutely tremendous to have that in someone like that in your corner. And so it is, and it releases the shame, right? Because they know, totally. like, I'm not going to judge them. I understand exactly. it firsthand. Mm -hmm. And that is significant in the healing process. Oh, my gosh. Completely. Absolutely. One thing as, a, you know, we were talking before, and I want to come back to this, is the sense of worth. Because this is something that it, it transforms as you go from in the thick of it to as you heal. Can you talk about your journey of self-worth from when you were in the thick of your eating disorder to where you are today and how that has changed and how you've cultivated self-worth? Mm, what a beautiful question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I look back, when I struggle with my eating disorder or that phase of my life, so in my 20s, mm -hmm. a lot of my worth was based on what I could achieve mm -hmm. and what I look like. And I saw that as a way to receive love mm -hmm. and admiration. And that made me feel somewhat safe um, and okay in this world. But as I have evolved um, and matured and be, you know lived a recovered life, I now find my worth more in my connections mm -hmm. with people and how I'm giving back to the world, how I seek to really take care of myself when I get out of balance and I'm noticing that and I'm like, okay, this is what I need to do now. Um, my priorities are just completely different. Sure, do I still have that place in me? I think it's in my nature. It's my traits of being like high achieving. Um, I certainly do want to look my best, you know, but no longer at the price of my soul. 
Mm. I will no longer try to achieve or look a certain way or be a certain size at the price of my soul. Mm -hmm. What is important to Sarah, starting with um, myself and what my values really are and how I connect with others, that's top priority. Oh, huge. I love that. And and I just love how you talk about your soul because there's such a difference. And it's like, I, I don't know if you know, but it's like, then when you're living in that, it's very ego driven. And then now you have like, when you're soul led, it's a whole different feel. Like you can still be a high achiever, but then you understand that what matters most is your heart, your well being, right. your mental, emotional, and physical capacity. And it's just such a huge difference and transition from that. And I, I just love how yeah. you bring that yeah. in because it is, it's such a different feel when you're leading, leaving, leading life soul led versus leading life ego led. Huge. It is. And it's, it's a, it's mm -hmm. a choice and it can be, you may need, I needed some environmental mm -hmm. changes, you know, when, um, I loved banking, but everything, I mean, every morning I'd wake up and my, I had a high position. So I'm pulling reports every morning and where is my district ranked in mm -hmm. this and this and this. And it was very uh, performance and numbers driven and very competitive. And it was difficult, I think, for me, even after I left my eating disorder behind to be more soul led because I was in an environment that didn't necessarily nourish that mm. or, or cultivate that. I'm not saying it can't be done like for me in the big corporate banking world. Mm -hmm. um, but it was challenging because where I was at most of the time was had a different culture and feel to it so it wasn't until i trusted my heart decided to leave banking take some risk right because i made great money take some risk do something different that i became more soul led and more in touch with myself so i just want to bring that up because i think some people are feeling like well i'm trying so hard to do it this way but i can't well sometimes it can really be environment yeah. And those that are around you, and I know it's very challenging to make those kind of big changes, mm -hmm. um, but it certainly helps in that journey. Absolutely. Yes. And I, I just love that. And it's like taking that leap of faith, you know, it's like we can move in fear, we can move in faith. And it is, it's like not downplaying the challenge of that. It's absolutely hard to make those big changes in life, but it's it there you often those big changes lead to the most beautiful transformations and you know you can see it time and time again and it, it's just that's absolutely beautiful but it's it's very easy to get stuck in that kind of corporate trap of feeling like you know especially when you have money and you have more demands the more successful you become the more you feel like you're you're stuck in it like i've worked so hard how do i leave this and it can be very easy to get trapped in that and so it does take incredible courage to say like i'm worth more than this like i need to take care of myself and remove right. myself from this that's so, right yeah that's and and it helps to have support like my husband was really mm -hmm. supportive and so it helps to have that support system mm -hmm. you know behind you when you're making those big changes yeah oh 100 percent, absolutely and and um that's everything really just having the right people in your corner and just really evaluating that like who can i trust who's going to be there for me who can i really have an open authentic conversation with and that's that's such right. a huge thing for someone, it's often, you know, there's such a big thing with like the questions we ask ourselves for someone who's listening to this and is in that really dark secretive place, doesn't know where to turn, where can they start as far as like, what questions can they start asking themselves to bring some awareness to themselves? Mm, love that. I think just asking, you know, two things, sometimes with eating disorders, I find that the consequences are more motivated, more motivating than reward. Mm -hmm. I know it was for me. So for instance, why I yeah. said my story earlier, you know, my health concerns, you know, what I was doing for my son, you know, the consequences that may come after that, that was motivating for me to change. So when I say this question, it is meant to just understand what could be a driver for somebody. But as you're in that dark place, listening right now, asking yourself, what is your life going to look like if you continue down the path you are right now mm -hmm. in a couple years, in five years? Mm -hmm. Like, is what do you think 
is going to happen if you don't decide to start pursuing recovery. Mm -hmm. And I know it's super scary, but I'll tell my clients a lot of times you can trust me till you can trust mm -hmm. yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think asking if I continue this, what is my life going to look like? Mm -hmm. You know, and then also asking yourself, you know, what is actually um, important to you mm -hmm. and how does that line up with your eating disorder? Mm -hmm. yeah. And most of the time people are going to find like, yeah, that doesn't really line up because um, a lot of times people will say, well, health is important to me. Having a healthy body. Well, if you have an eating disorder, mm -hmm. I'm telling you, your health is just, it, it, it's not if, it's when it's going to catch up mm -hmm. with you. It oh. will. I promise, right? You know better oh, than anyone as a doctor. It's coming. 100%. You may think, oh, I'm fine now, but then it's going to hit like it did for me. Like, mm -hmm. whoa, what is all of this, right? Yeah. So knowing like, no, that doesn't line up with that. My family's important to me. Okay, how does your eating disorder line up with that? It doesn't mm -hmm. because we know the eating disorder filters everything. Mm -hmm. So you're having, you're planning a family dinner. You're having a holiday meal. You know, your eating disorder is right there trying to figure out mm -hmm. how to have the least amount of calories or are you going to secretly eat you know, in privacy, because you don't want people to see what you're eating, it hovers over everything. So it actually is stealing moments from your family. So yeah. just concisely, you know, asking if you continue this, what is your life going to look like into the future? And then looking at what is truly important to you and asking yourself, now, how does my eating disorder align with this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great questions. And it's it's so insightful when you start answering those questions for yourself and really dive deep without judgment. You know, it's like that's the big thing is like really just understanding yourself and where do you want your what do you want your life to look like? And it's it that I remember my asking myself that question when I was 25. And I'm like, I don't want to live like this. I don't know how like you don't need to know the how. I think that's what it is. You get stuck in the how, but it's like, what do you want and why? And then then the how figures itself out. And, and a lot of times too, it's like when you have that support, when you can get in contact with people who have been through this, that's, that's how the how works itself out. You don't have to worry about that. But sometimes, especially when you're a high achiever perfectionist, you have to have, you think you have to have everything figured out right now you get so overwhelmed and then you paralyze action and that's the worst thing you can do. So it's, it is just taking those small steps. And I love those questions you ask. It's like for anyone who's listening and this is resonating with you, start asking yourself those questions, write things out. It clears your head to really bring it to reality. Cause sometimes we get so stuck in our head of like how we're thinking and the, the patterns, but when you write things out and you look at it, or you maybe revisit a week from now, you'd be like, wow. Okay. I, I see this more clearly. 100%. And if you knew how to do it, you would not be in this position. Mm -hmm. So it's okay that you don't know how. And with bulimia specifically, your mind will get really stuck on, right, Kelly, the how do I stop mm -hmm. the binging and purging? How do I stop that piece? Mm -hmm. And when I went into and I come up with all these ways that I was going to stop doing this, and mm -hmm. obviously, none of them worked. Yeah. Um, in those moments when the compulsion would hit, I would figure out a way and nothing was necessarily going to stop me. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't when, in, when I went into recovery, it wasn't until then that I realized, oh, wait, I got to address this whole Weight Watchers restriction thing. And yeah. I remember telling my therapist like, huh? <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, because that really shocked me. Like okay. I needed to give up that part. And that may seem yeah. obvious for some people, but it wasn't to me. Mm -hmm. for, for her to tell me you need to stop counting Weight Watcher points was like, huh? Yeah. So I'm just, that's a good example of, I thought I just needed to figure out how to stop the binging and purging. And I would be like free of all this. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, oh, wait, there's also this restriction piece. Mm -hmm. And why am I so glued into this? Oh, there's beliefs under that about how I'm loved and valued. Oh yeah, there's some trauma I didn't even know I needed to deal with. Like it just started to unfold in a way mm -hmm. that you cannot possibly figure it out, in my opinion, all on your own. Maybe you can figure out some, but mm -hmm. all of it to be completely free, I think is super hard. Yeah. Um, now you did it. You, you didn't seek help and you figured out how to do it. Yeah. It, it honestly though, it, in hindsight, it took me years. Like I would have been, I would have been able to get my life back on track much quicker if I had sought help. 
I, and I, I'm just, that's one of my limiting beliefs that I've had to overcome is I don't receive help. I, and like, that's, I do everything on my own. I'm fiercely independent. It, it like, this is something I've had to work through is like, I felt like it was a sign of weakness if I sought help. And now I don't believe that. I know that's not true. It's actually, you know, it's a sign of strength when you do seek help. And, but that, you know, I, for anyone, you know, even though I was able to do it on my own, I don't recommend it because I, I know I could have gotten things back on track quicker if I had yeah. gotten more support. So yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I, there was something you said I wanted to go back to, um, <laughs> Oh, uh, like, right I, I and you lost it. <laughs> oh, it's okay. I know. Oh, maybe it'll come back to me. But um, yeah, I was just trying to think of uh I'll have to um one thing I did want to ask you because uh, I'm kind of wrapping up, but I want to ask you because this is something I find that a lot of people and I have struggled with this myself, is that oftentimes when we're like perfectionists, we're also people pleasers. And so we want to make everybody and everything okay around us. So we often self-sacrifice ourselves in the process. And being a mother going through that, can you talk about your experience of oftentimes we'll put our kids before us even and kind of let ourselves suffer. Can you talk about how your own recovery was actually putting your child at first because you were a better mom for your child? 100%. You know, um, I, I, I was placing him in first position when I went into recovery because I knew that anytime we went out to eat, we went to an amusement park, anything, my eating disorder was right there trying to, in my head, manage the food, calculate things, try to prevent a binge and purge, all this kind of stuff. And it removed me from the moments with him. Mm -hmm. Right. And to this day, you know, if, when I think about it, it makes me sad because I really did miss moments with my son as he was a young boy, because my eating disorder took root about when he was about six months to a year old. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so by going into recovery, I knew I wanted to change for him. And he was one of my biggest motivations, mm -hmm. you know, to change. And he'll say to this day, you know, mom, I remember like thinking, I wonder why my mom has to eat like that. Mm -hmm. you know he's I remember mm -hmm. thinking that way because we'd go like to go get something to eat and you would try to make sure it was small or eliminate certain things or always have a special order or no sauce and he's like I just remember like thinking why does she have to do that and just a young little boy because you know I went to recovery when he was seven yeah. so you know choosing recovery not only is lifting the veil so you can be present with your kiddos it is also showing them and being a good example for them, right, with your relationship with food and body. Mm -hmm. I'll often tell my moms, you know, when I'm working with their daughters specifically, you know, one of the best things you can do is work on healing your own relationship with your food, with food and body to be a good example for your daughter. Because even though you may not have an eating disorder, but you're following a keto diet, your daughter sees this. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. For example, totally. right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, yes, the people pleasing part, you know, that like any of our traits, they can be used as assets or liabilities. <laughs> and mm -hmm. with that trait, you can use it in a realm to say, I want to be better for my kiddos, mm -hmm. right? And my children. Yep. And in a way that is pleasing because mm -hmm. you're moving into a more positive relationship with them and with yourself. Yeah, I love that. And it's it's so true. Those those subconscious messages we receive, it's like we can hear someone can say, do this, don't do, don't do that. But then when you see them doing something, something, especially someone who's so impressionable as like a parent, it leaves a lasting impression when you see that. And you're like, okay, I guess this is how I'm supposed to eat. I guess this is how I'm supposed to view my body. And it really does leave that impression. So it is such a gift to our families when you start to yeah. get yourself in a healing place and and start making those changes. So thank you for sharing that because I, I find that's also often like, you know, I, I wasn't a, a mother at the time of my eating disorder, but I can imagine that would just very much complicate it. And when you can bring some clarity to that, that no, your healing is going to be the best gift for your child. It, it, I imagine it, it makes such a difference in pushing you forward and continuing on with that when, you know, especially as a mom, you want to do everything for your children. So thank oh, you. For and, and you're welcome. And, you know, it has such a, a beautiful, um, 
timeline in my story because when I decided I wanted to go get certified and I have four certifications, that was my first certification. And um, I, I shared it with my son at that time. He was like 15, 16 years old. And mm -hmm. I remember him like, you know, I'm so proud of you, mom. And like, he just felt so proud that, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I had gone on this journey, but I was turning it around to now help other people. And so my relationship with my son throughout it is such like a rewarding, beautiful place because mm -hmm. him finding me shifted me. He's been a great cheerleader for me along the way. And even to this day, you know, supports me and wants to hear about things. I know we're at the end of the podcast, so I'll bring up to um, this course that um, I've just launched. And the segue is my son has been very supportive and testing out things for me Aww, and doing stuff for me on the technology end. Aww. Um, but you know her, Merit Elizabeth. She's mm -hmm. my really good friend. She's a fellow certified eating disorder coach. And last year over dinner, we were like, we want to do something together. And we both have the lived experience of bulimia. We are both recovered. And as you start to look for resources on bulimia, you will actually be shocked mm -hmm. that there's not a lot out there. Mm -hmm. It oftentimes gets lumped together also with anorexia and binge eating. Um, you can find resources for specifically anorexia and specifically binge eating, but there's this gap. So Merritt and I set out, it became a labor of love mm -hmm. <laughs> over the next 10 months. And we created the course that is called Conquering Bulimia. It is an online private self-paced course just for bulimia. We have um, over 70 videos in the course that are divided out between mind, body, spirit. Also, um, we have experts that have joined us in the field of eating disorders throughout. We give all our best coaching tips, our personal lived experience stories, um, and in addition, how to keep moving forward in recovery. So we really see this as a tool um, that can help jumpstart recovery. So if someone's listening right now, they've heard us talking all about bulimia, Kelly yeah. and the shame and the isolation and the persona we show to the world. And they're thinking, you're thinking right now, that's me. Um, this may be a good way to just jumpstart your recovery and start to dive in on your own terms, right? And in a place you can feel comfortable with. The other goal um, uh, for Merit and I was to make something affordable. Eating disorder recovery in general can be on the expensive side. So we wanted to create something that most people can afford. Mm -hmm. And so again, that's at conqueringbulimia.com. You can check us out if you want to. We'd love to be a resource to help people, whether you're beginning your journey as a jump start, as I just said, you're in it, you need additional resources, um, you know, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. I love that. And like I said, I wish this was, this existed 20 years ago, but I love that you're doing it now because there are so many people who are, may listen to this and really don't even know where to turn, don't want to jump full force into something, or it feels very scary. And like, this is just a great, great thing that you have set up. And I highly recommend, you know, you're amazing. Merit's amazing. So Thank just you. amazing resources and people to help you along the process. And just absolutely love what you guys put together. And the fact too, that it's self-paced, it's like, because again, I, when you're going through that, it's like, it can feel so daunting when you, you know, if you're in a group setting or you have to disclose things or you're getting pinned into answering questions that you don't feel ready to answer and that all evokes stress response. So the fact that it's a self-paced course gives you the resources for you to uncover things at your own pace. And I, I love that. So That's highly right. recommend that. I'm going to put the link in the show notes for anyone who wants to connect with you guys and, and dive into that course. And also where else can they find you? So they can find me also, my website is Sarah Lee Recovery. So if you're interested in learning more about one-on-one -on -one coaching and uh, you can find me there, I do have my Facebook business page. <laughs> but as we just said earlier, I'm under a bit of a shadow ban right now because I talked about bulimia, but you can find me on there. I do post and share on there. Um, and then um, in addition, of course, the Conquering Bulimia, which you'll add below. But even when my caseload is full, you know, and my schedule can't allow for 
any more one-on-one because I'm one of the more tenured certified coaches. My network is vast. So I happily volunteer to help people match up with a good coach for them. So don't be afraid to reach out, whether it's me or somebody else you want to work with. um, If one-on-one coaching is something you desire. I love that. Yeah. And what a great, you know, just having that resource and just somebody in your corner who understands it. And there's so many, like we said, so many little nuances to especially bulimia that when you have someone who's lived and breathed it, they're going to understand you in such a way that no one else could. So highly recommend that. I'm going to put all your contact information in the show notes too. So definitely reach out to Sarah, you know, get the resources, dive into the course and really Take this as your nudge from the universe that here's your time to to take care of yourself, get your life back and start being present for the moments that you don't want to watch pass you by anymore. So thank you, Sarah. This has just been such an amazing conversation. I love it. And I am so excited to share this episode out to everyone because I really think many people are going to resonate with it. So thank you. I hope so. Thank you so much for having me on, Kelly. Absolutely. And again, if you're listening to this, Share this with someone who you may think may benefit from it. You know, sometimes, especially if you have a friend, it it maybe doesn't hit when you say it to them or may feel a little uncomfortable for you to say something if you think they're struggling. But sometimes when you share an episode, it may be just the thing they need to hear to move themselves in the in the right direction. So please share this episode for with someone who needs to hear it. And you know, thank you again for everyone who's listening today today. Thank you.